Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to this session. Today, we'll be talking about study clouds and how to create um, resilient and software-defined data centers. I'll be um, co-presenting this session with my colleague, Christian. A few words about, um, about myself. Um, so I'm Daniel Virasamy. I'm one of the cloud solutions architects working for Murantis. I've been working for Murantis uh, for four years now. And before that, I um, worked in the cloud space um, in the telco domain. And I've always been an um, open source advocate. Christian, do you want to say some words about yourself? Yeah, I've been uh, working for Marantis for over nine years now. Uh, I've started with them when OpenStack was still, uh, let's say, more than a little bit buggy, and I learned more in those first few years than uh, eventually came up. Uh, I'm a principal architect. My specialty is hardware infrastructure and storage. And uh, I occasionally also write code, but uh, this is more incidental to what I'm doing than, than uh, a profession. Thank you, Christian. So the usual disclaimer, as this is a, a, a public uh, presentation, we have the Mirantis disclaimer. Uh, we'll just change also this one. We also have a scavenger hunt. So if you want to scan this um, QR code, we have some goodies that you can uh, obtain at the, the beer garden. I'll, I'll just um, put it back at the end of the, of the session if you don't have, have time. Yes, you do want to take it? Yes, let's do it. Let's put it back here. It's all good? Yeah? Okay. Almost good? All right. So. What we have on the agenda today is, we'll, we'll just first start with looking at why we want to design for, for um, the cloud for failure, right? And why this is important. And even with the extra cost in terms of man and hardware, why we want, why is it still worth this, this effort. Um, we'll also look into then how to do it on the infrastructure side, how to do it on the software side, how applications are also important in that space, and then we'll end with um, operational excellence and, and, and support. Um, we want to treat study, studiness, study clouds, the same way as security. So that's why we took the, the parallel with an onion, and we want to peel out each of these, of these layers. So we, we start with um, the base, which is planning. And planning is very, very important across all these, all these different layers. We also want to take care of the security of the cloud. We want to also want to take care of the applications, backup and, and, and disaster recovery deployment, infrastructure, and, and keep that as an ongoing, ongoing process, right? And what we'll do now, now during this presentation is go and peel out each of these, of these um, layers. So Christian, just explain to us why then this is so important to build um, everything cloud. So I have had, I go to customer planning sessions uh, several times a year. And I always get the question, why are you planning for failure? Why, are you, um, why do you think your cloud will fail? Well, I don't, but I don't want to face the consequences if my cloud will have a, develop a problem, if, if there is failure. I, want, I will wish that I have had played, uh, planned for that failure and made, it, uh, made my cloud uh, resist uh, common problems that, that, that can co uh, crop up. Uh, catastrophic loss of business data is ob obviously this is something no system administrator want, ever wants to uh, experience. Uh, you will probably be beheaded by your, by your bosses, and this is uh, something that I personally do not relish. Uh, infrastructure down for a week, this is another major thing. If, you have, uh, if your environment is not built in a way that you can recover quickly from, fa from failure, you will uh, lose customers simply by not being available by, by uh, customers going to the competition. The need to rebuild everything is about uh, coming, coming up with a, way, with a way to be operational while you are fixing your main cloud, meaning disaster recovery. And then finally, destroy the business and the company's image. We've had that in the past multiple times that companies uh, lost major amounts of, of customer data and uh, the fallout is typically not pretty, not pretty. Also, of course, ransomware lately, there has been a rash of ransomware attacks, especially on uh, uh, public uh, 
entities like hospitals and city government. And uh, this has, uh, in many cases, this has uh, crippled an organization to the point where they could not work for a prolonged amount of time. Let's start with how we are going to secure our cloud. First of all, infrastructure. We have to make sure that our uh, infrastructure and uh, uh, is planned in a way. We have uh, uh, this, this needs to be done before you make any decisions on what you are going to buy, what you are going to deploy. There needs to be a, a plan and this plan needs to be ad adhered to. Uh, infrastructure, building infrastructure physically, I've been working in data centers uh, for years and uh, being, uh, being able to cable something in a way that it will be uh, resistant to somebody pulling the wrong cable or uh, some uh, failure is important. User recommended bill of materials, which means specifically do not build too small and do not build too large. I had an extreme ex example a few weeks ago. Somebody asked me, can I build a Ceph cluster out of three nodes with 80 disks each of eight terabytes each? Um, so uh, I had to tell them, well, yes, you can, theoretically. Uh, but what happens if one of those nodes fails? You're going to sink uh, until until the, the uh, world collapses into a black hole. So, uh, no, uh, building something, this, is, this is, it brings us right back to build, to making the plan. Build something in the middle. This is, uh, if you build something that is too small, or let's say too compact, uh, you're going to have a bad time, and if you build something that is too big, uh, too big you're going to have the same. So come up with a solution that is, uh, workable, but it's not so compact that uh, failure of an individual component is going to kill you. Then finally, um, don't use exotic hardware. Um, I'm not a big fan of uh, um, prescribing somebody what they should use, but uh, there are some players in the market who have a reputation for uh, bad quality I'm not, I'm not specifically talking about server manufacturers, but component manufacturers, and inform yourself about what you are going to put into that. And implement uh, uh, unusual layouts. This goes, for instance, uh, for uh, designs where you do edge computing, where, uh, where you um, need to come up with a solution that is, uh, can potentially work across uh, an unsta unstable link. Um, the, you have to come up with a solution that will still survive this. So, low risk, low risk deployments. This is one layer um, up from the very inside of the onion. When you are deploying OpenStack, deployment, uh, yes, somebody can deploy OpenStack manually. I have seen it done. I have uh, not seen it succeed in production ever. This is, if you do not have some sort of automation, could be self-built automation, it could be automation that you buy from a vendor, but uh, either way, um, there needs to be some automation around it, and you are not only buying the automation itself, you're not buying, only buying yourself the um, reduced amount of work that automation brings you, but you're also buying yourself best practices that have been honed across 50 other customers that you would be, if you were to uh, try to do this yourself, you would never be able to get the same amount of expertise that you will get uh, when, when you are getting an automation, an, an automation platform. Then the next thing is, uh, do we really need feature X? This is something that uh, I also hear um, do you support Masakari, uh, whatever? Yes, uh, a lot of features are necessary, useful, but if you do not have a requirement for a feature, I would uh, leave it out and only implement it when you uh, uh, actually find a need for it, which brings us right back to the deployment automation, which uh, makes it easy to deploy that feature into your cloud. But make it start with something that we call in uh, what I call when, when I go to customers, MVP, minimum viable product. Make something, shoot for something that you can achieve, that, is, that makes sense for you, that is, uh, has all the features that you need for init initially, and then go and make the, the, the whole thing more complicated when you, when you actually find the need to do, to do so. 
And automation is everything. Uh, if you customize something outside of automation, this is the most dangerous thing that you could possibly do to your cloud uh, uh, configuration that cannot be replicated if you, for instance, upgrade or if you build something, uh, add, add something to your cloud. This is something that should never, ever happen. Another topic is disaster recovery and also geo-redundancy that goes with it. You could build, build a disaster recovery cloud in the same data center that, that you have your cloud in. The problem with this is that if you get, if the earth opens up and it swallows your data center or if uh, an airplane falls onto it, then your disaster recovery environment is just going to be just as dead as your, as your original environment, which is why we typically have disaster recovery environments on a, a geo-redundant scale. But, um, it could be something in the US in a different uh, um, disaster zone, speak, so to speak. But uh, something far enough away that a local, a local disaster is not going to kill you. Um, the downside to this, of course, is that you are going to replicate data across uh, van link, which means you have limited cap uh, capacity on that link. And the one thing that you do not want to happen to yourself is that uh, you have a data set and an active data set and a recovery data set, and that the link is not big enough to keep the uh, to keep the environments in sync and they diverge. And then if something happens, you are going to start with a much older data set than, than, uh, than you do have that. The other thing, of course, to think about are databases. Make sure that the databases are actually uh, replicated, not only the underlying volumes. So, um, yeah, one more thing. Um, when you're building a cloud, uh, you could, of course, test all the, thing that, the things that you need to do in your production cloud. I personally wouldn't do it because I have seen too many times uh, that uh, this causes uh, call it 3 a.m., which I'm not particularly fond of. So uh, what we recommend is to build something very small but similar to your existing cloud where you can test changes to automation, changes to, the, uh, changes to uh, for instance, features you want to implement, let's say OpenStack Masakari, and you want to test this first, you have to have a small cloud where you can actually try it, uh, try it out, and then you can uh, use the same automation to deploy this into your main data center. One more thing, backup and recovery, and then Daniel uh, gets the talk. Um, what is disaster recovery and what is backup? Disaster recovery, get online very quickly with the absolute minimum that you need to continue your business. It, uh, it's supposed to only be a stopgap until you manage to fix your main environment. What it is definitely not is, the, uh, is uh, backup. For instance, let, uh, let's, guess, uh, let's say you are getting hit by a ransomware attack and you have a direct data sync to your uh, disaster recovery environment. The same is going to happen to your disaster recovery environment, which is why you also should uh, have backup of all the mission critical data that you can roll back to a state uh, that was before that uh, catastrophe happened. DR is also not high availability. You could theoretically have two, two environments that cross sync data and you uh, use as a high availability, but this is not what disaster recovery per se is. It's not fault tolerance. Fault tolerance is built into the platform, but it is also not uh, disaster recovery, and it is also not a backup for the, for the reasons we already mentioned. So disaster recovery, you have to absolutely plan the, uh, for the catastrophe, and you also should test it. You should not um, implement something and then hope that it will work and when, when something catastrophic happens, but actually make sure that it does work. So uh, important, it's super important to make sure that you only uh, identify the data that you actually have to uh, migrate over. You have to have a, um, a platform that is similar but can be much smaller than the main platform that you're talking about. And uh, to make sure that you can quickly, very quickly separate, sever the, the link and bring up the uh, remote platform as operational. This also, of course, uh, includes some network magic this is, uh, uh, that is unavoidable, 
but uh, you definitely can make a system that uh, can come up in, in a couple of hours at most. Then, of course, in what order? Um, this goes back to automating the uh, not only, only the platform, but also the software that is on it to make sure that uh, the, um, uh, your applications are built in the right order to uh, properly fire up. So, disaster recovery plans, preparing for disaster recovery, create the documentation. This is something that uh, a lot of people forget. Um, uh, yeah, we know how our disaster recovery environment works, then the guy who knew, who knew that leaves the company and all of a sudden you don't know that. So make sure that it is actually documented. Execute the plan, make sure that uh, everything that is in the documentation is actually uh, executed properly and that the documentation and the, uh, the real world implementation match each other. And uh, then uh, prepare the individual applications uh, for the disaster recovery, make sure that uh, you can uh, start them in the remote environment uh, and uh, test, this, uh, test this occasionally. Finally, backup. A lot of people say, okay, we have a Ceph cluster, Ceph cluster does three times replication, I do not need to backup. What happens if the data, if an actual volume becomes corrupted? Meaning, could be some software bug, something running wild, could be somebody who hits you with ransomware, could be somebody, some uh, malicious operator inside who is uh, um, actually just decides to, uh, to erase some volumes randomly. But anyway, um, make sure that uh, the data is backed up in a uh, concise fashion. And please, please do not do uh, incremental backups forever. There are examples of uh, how, this, how this really went wrong. Incremental backups should be for a few days at max, and uh, then sh there should be the next full backup. Uh, going back for more than a week for, for a full backup is really bad. So I think this was about it on that side. Yes. So now to Daniel. Thank you, Christian. Um, so we, we looked at the infrastructure, um, we looked at disaster recovery, um, definitely selecting uh, the infrastructure code is important. Uh, we are all at open infra, so I'm not going to convince you about the open source, uh, the open source model, but just um, some, some numbers, some facts. Um, based on some research, uh, we see that 89% um, of, of uh, large companies are using, are using open source. And some of them are using open source uh, across various entities within the, within the organization. Sometimes they don't know what they are using and where they are using it, but um, that's, that's one of the challenges that I'm going to talk to um, in, a, in the next slide. The second thing about open... Oh, sorry. Um, sorry no problem. Um, the next thing about open source is also the innovation. Um, developers uh, will be able to innovate, add new features, um, um, be able to outspace competition by using, by using what is available for the open source communities. There's no, no need to reinvent the wheel, and, 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 but be part of that community and, and contribute. Choice is also something which is very, very important. And, and as we are talking about study clouds, um, having the choice of selecting the proper uh, project, the proper deployment uh, tool, is also part of the whole, the whole strategy around how to build robust uh, um, infrastructure, so not to get into a, a lock-in lock -in situation. But obviously, open source also comes with its own challenges, and these challenges, if I can um, resume them, we have challenges around the legal compliance and governance part. Uh, as I said, um, many of these companies, the 89% of these um, large companies, sometimes don't even know what they are using. Um, they don't have the exact portfolio of what they are using, and each of these projects have uh, various um, licensing models. So it is important then to tackle that with the proper uh, procedure. Uh, community and maintainers uh, and contributors, this is also one of the challenges because it is kind of time consuming. Each and every project has its own code, so being able to push code within, like for example, OpenStack or Kubernetes or, uh, or Ceph uh, have different mechanisms. Complexity, support, and reliability is, is one of the big challenges also in the sense that these large um, infrastructure at scale on multiple sites are more and more complex, 
and you also need to optimize that, 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 that element. Security, vulnerability, and risk, definitely one of the biggest challenges uh, across these different, uh, these different projects. This should be even at the top of the list uh, as, a, as, as a job zero uh, element, uh, simply because you can't push uh, open source code without making sure that it is uh, properly hardened. And then the last one is skills, availability, and retention. Uh, we all, and that's why we are also hiring uh, at Mirantis. Um, we, uh, it's very, very uh, complicated to have uh, people that are properly um, skilled in each of these open source solutions and, and, and retain, retain them. So how do we tackle all this then? Again, that's a, 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 a theme of this presentation is to plan. Right? We need to build that plan around how to tackle the, the open source uh, software. So have a clear policy of who uses OpenStack, what projects uh, they are using, and also who validates uh, all these, uh, all these uh, projects. Then contribute in a, in a sustainable way. And what I mean by sustainable way here is have people that are doing this as their day-to-day -day job, not on their, on, on by the side of their day-to-day -day job, so that they can spend the proper amount of time by, and, and directly or indirectly contrib contributing to these, to these projects. And then the last element is focus on, on, on where you are or your organization is bringing value. And sometimes this also means that invest in, uh, in um, your partners uh, in the sense that they will also help you or you will also help them to uh, contribute into uh, multiple, multiple projects. Security is, is, as I said, key. Um, avoid hands-on. Uh, this is really, really bad. So infrastructure as code concept is, is something which is uh, um, uh, key uh, here. You want to avoid, uh, or you want to be able to audit of uh, who and when uh, someone did uh, interact with the, with the platform to have all the automation around, around that. Deploy your cluster also with uh, a minimum amount of, of trust to make sure that uh, you are able to uh, add the proper privileges around who accesses the platform and, and why. Run the penetration testing for sure. Uh, secure the perimeter first and then enable, so these are the, basic, the basics around security, right? So um, uh, set up the, 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 the um, proper authentication mechanism like two uh, FA or MFA. One thing we possibly should mention here, OpenStack has a very granular system of granting access to, for people to resources. And it's, in my opinion, pretty underused. Most people just do what, what's default. Just look into it. You can actually um, have, for instance, operators that have no access at all that can only see what's happening and so on. Um, build, the, uh, build your own roles the way that uh, they are actually needed uh, to, uh, to make sure that you do not um, give more permissions to people than you absolutely have to. Exactly. Um, Applications also is part of that, that whole strategy. And, and uh, we can build a, as robust and as sturdy um, infrastructure as possible, but you will always have cases where things fail, right? And that's what we, we started the presentation with. So the applications also need to take uh, the benefits of the infrastructure and be able to uh, cope with um, any failures. So immutable, immutable applications is one of the approach around, around this um, uh, cloud native disaster recovery and applications. Using Kubernetes, for example, as a cloud operating system across various uh, environments, infrastructure, is something which is very, very interesting to explore. Um, that also relates to being able to have that reversibility um, capability and, and sovereignty capability. Um, and uh, being able to move them in, a, in an active, active, or an active, passive mode is, um, is important. If we can't have that immutable pattern and, and continuize the application, at least on the VM side, we should be able to segregate uh, the different layers. So for example, have a separate layer for operating system, have a separate layer for the application, and then have a separate layer for the user data. And for the user data then, we just modularize the, the, the data so that we can move them across various, various replication, replication sites, which would also ensure faster, faster recovery. Yeah, another, another note here, sorry. Um, this is, uh, 
the separation between uh, op uh, operating system that is um, basically comes from an image application that comes from an orchestrator and user data that's actually produced by the um, uh, by the users of your platform. Uh, it's also important when you do things like disaster recovery, if you can uh, avoid replicating anything that is not actually user data across your link, you already save yourself 70% of the data capacity that you need for the line between your primary and their DR environment. And the same goes for backups. You should not ever have to backup operating system or application. This should all be, uh, be rebuildable automatically from assets that you have. Uh, the backup should be reserved for actual user data. And then rapidly on the ec uh, operational excellence, and I'm going to focus on, on observability here. Uh, we could spend the whole 30 minutes on this. So um, the first thing is define the KPI. Uh, define how you are measuring your um, uh, availability of your platform, right? Like for example, 99.9% uh, .9 SLA on API availabilities of your, of your platform. Um, have also the ability to do real-time logs and metrics to be able to monitor the infrastructure, but also the applications, right? And then as you scale out, because you have multiple sites, uh, you want to be geo-redundant, geo you want to have a disaster recovery site, so as you scale out, you want also to be able to aggregate all these logs and, and, and metrics, and then consume these to be able to build concise dashboards, uh, have long-term retention period to be able to audit, and then most importantly, uh, for your support organization, proactively being able to fix and, and do uh, forecasting, right? So um, with that, um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, do you have any questions? Yes, we have the mic, which is at the back, I think. Okay. <laughs> is this better? Okay. So uh, disaster recovery, testing disaster recovery is not I'm simply like I'm switching off my main site and we uh, are just going to run the disaster recovery site for a while to see whether, whether everything works. Um, so there are different strategies to testing it. One of them is to test individual applications that you can uh, prepare in a way that they can run on the disaster recovery sites so they, uh, so they do that. But of course, the downside to that is that you do not know whether all your applications uh, can do that. The second possibility would be to, for, for all of your application to use a staging cloud and, use, uh, and try uh, running this uh, environment or running these applications um, outside of your main cloud with uh, appropriate, um, let's say, network changes that are necessary to make that visible. You could do that only on the inside, so you do not actually have to um, open this up to the internet. But uh, this is that's a possibility. Um, the true switch of the uh, switch of the main site, I have not really ever seen working anyway. I think that. Um, as much as it pains me to say, because I would uh, love to be able to say, okay, we are standing here, we have um, designed this properly, uh, we have tested it, it is working. Uh, in reality, you probably will not be able to do that, but you can just do your best uh, to make sure that uh, your plan is actually executable and then build it. But this is a very, very good question. Thank you very much. The slides will be put up by Open Infra Summit, um, but uh, if you would like, hang on, let's go all the way back to through this. Um, you can also email me or Daniel. Um, we have our uh, uh, email addresses here. So uh, if you um, have, uh, would like to, or if you cannot find those, please let me know or let us know. You're welcome. Any more questions? No? 
So, but well, again, beer garden is outside. I think it might be a good a, 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 exactly so, um, <laughs> a good idea. That, that was what, what I was going to say. I'm, let's, I'm going to put yeah, yes, again, so the, 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 the QR code, uh, if, you QR code to, again, if somebody wants more time to, to, wants to, to win the, some, some goodies. And um, yes, let's and, meet at the beer garden. And we have some hats here. Um, how, do we, how do we give them out? Uh, can you, can you